If you approach Shaftesbury from the Warminster direction on the A350, the sign says, Welcome to Shaftesbury, home of Gold Hill. That's Shaftesbury's iconic Hovis Hill, made famous by the Ridley Scott commercial. But approach on the Gillingham Road and the old sign says Shaftesbury, Saxon Hilltop Town. And that's what it's really all about. Because this hilltop town owes its very existence to a famous Saxon king, Alfred the Great. It was in the 880s that Alfred chose this dramatic spur of land, which drops off steeply on three sides, as the site for one of his burrs, fortified towns to counter the threat from the marauding Danish Vikings who had overrun most of the country. But why choose this particular hill? Maybe it had been given defences a thousand years earlier, in the Iron Age. This is one of Shaftesbury's mysteries. So Alfred built a town. But a few years later, in 888, after he defeated the Vikings, he built something else that was to have an even greater impact on Shaftesbury. By the east gate of his town, he founded an abbey. This was hugely significant. A royal foundation endowed with enormous wealth and a house of women, many of the nuns from aristocratic families. Indeed, the first abbess was none other than Alfred's own teenage daughter, Ethelgifu. We know very little of that first abbey. Its buildings may even have been of wood. Now, the early excavations did produce some traces of stone foundations, though, and here in the Abbey Museum are fragments of stone that offer tantalising glimpses of how that first Saxon Abbey may have looked. What we do know from historical documents is that the Abbey quickly grew in wealth and power. Gifts of land and property, money left for prayers for the dead, and revenue from pilgrims. Because by the year 1000, Shaftesbury Abbey had the tombs of two saints. Queen Ethelgifu, the wife of King Edmund, who died in 944, and of her grandson, Edward the Martyr, the young king foully murdered at Corfe Castle in the year 978. Now, saints could work miracles. Miracles attracted pilgrims, and pilgrims meant income. Because they needed somewhere to stay, they needed places to eat, they brought souvenirs, they made offerings. All good for the economy of both the abbey and the town. Over the centuries and under the rule of powerful abbesses, the abbey grew. Home at its peak to over 120 nuns. Legacies of land, both far and near, resulted in a huge estate and vast income. Indeed, it was said that if the Abbess of Shaftesbury had married the Abbot of Glastonbury, which clearly couldn't have happened, then together they'd have had more wealth and power than the King. As the Abbey grew, so its buildings became larger and more elaborate. Eulalia, the first Norman Abbess, initiated a major rebuild between 1080 and 1120. The result? A huge church, 88 metres long, which dominated the hilltop on which it stood. But all this came to an end in the reign of Henry VIII. A quarrel with the church in Rome and a greedy eye on the wealth of the English monasteries led to the dissolution in 1536, the destruction of monastic life in England. None were spared. Shaftesbury held out until 1539, when the last abbess, Elizabeth Zouche, was forced to sign the deed of surrender, effectively giving the abbey and all its possessions to the king's commissioner, John Tregonwell. In some cases, the people of the town simply adopted the abbey church as their own. But Shaftesbury's was too big, and also the town already had six churches. 
And then there was Trigonwell, who was a noted despoiler. He liked knocking things down. And all this was compounded by the fact that the new owner of the Abbey estate, Thomas Arundel, was just about to build a new house over there and the Abbey ruins would be a very useful source of building material. The destruction was rapid and thorough. Only nine years after the surrender, this small sketch shows the church in ruins and by 1574 all buildings were described as having been laid low to the ground. The abbey had completely vanished. For nearly 300 years the church lay undisturbed under gardens until archaeological investigations started in the 1860s. This marked the beginning of 70 years of sporadic digging which exposed the shattered ruins of this once magnificent church. By modern standards, these excavations were comparatively crude. They were a sort of clearance exercise designed to expose solid foundations and to recover obvious finds like decorative stonework and floor tiles. After the last campaign in 1932, the exposed remains were laid out like this, with banks marking walls and pillars shown by heaps of stone, creating not only a beautiful garden, but a true sense of scale. But over time, doubts have been cast on elements of this very confident layout. There are walls in places where there seems to be little or no evidence, and then there are structures in places where they simply don't make sense. It was time to start exploring. Today, there are ways of investigating that don't involve excavation. Geophysical survey can see through the soil and map buried walls and floors. A resistivity survey by Bournemouth University provided the first clear image of the below ground remains. And then, a team from the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Vienna created a highly detailed three-dimensional scan of the above ground structures. At the same time, they used ground-penetrating radar to map what lay beneath the surface, providing valuable information about the depth of the remains. All this helped us to better understand the Abbey Church, although there were still puzzles. In some places, massive walls appeared where nothing was marked on the surface. In others, there seemed to be a surprising lack of below-ground structures. It was quite obvious we weren't going to get any further without digging. We decided that we could probably answer several of our questions in one long trench. So we've got one trench here that runs from the cloister, and this is part of the wall of the cloister walk. Whether this gap is real or not, we don't know. Then you've got the cloister walk itself, and we wanted to look at this bit here because this is a, a buttress supposedly against the south wall of the church but it's in a completely illogical place because it's halfway across the cloister walk. So then we've got the south wall of the church which is presumably or supposed to be absolutely massive and it is marked on either side by rows of ashlars faced stones but they're just set in soil. They don't, look, they don't look like part of a medieval structure. So that's basically outside the church and this wall. Then we go inside and into the blessed shade provided by this tent, where there's a whole series of other questions. Now, one of these relates to where the floor level in the Abbey Church was, because out in the grass there are patches of tiles which are supposedly set at the, the level where the church floor was, but we're not certain that they are at the right level, and the first indications from this trench is that they're not. We haven't found anything that looks vaguely structural in here. And then there's these. Now these heaps of stones supposedly mark the position of the massive pillars, the nave pillars of a, an arcaded aisle along here. But a few years ago I dug underneath one of those and there was absolutely nothing underneath it. So how real are these or are these completely imaginary? And what is the wall that they sit on? Because the radar suggested there was something very solid here 
but nothing on the other side. So there are, there are lots of questions that are going to be answered by this one trench. Right, now what we've got to do is to make this tile fit in there. Now at the moment, if you look at it, that's not fitting very well at all, is it? What we have to do is to push it down with our hands like that. And watch what happens. Right? That's it. Right, you're supposed to be with the, okay. this group here. Okay. This is super, well done. That's it, put it right down. Now, excavations need people to do the digging. And we'd recruited an army of volunteers, both old and young. Over 450 pupils from 11 local schools had been introduced to archaeology in the classroom and had learnt medieval skills at the Abbey. Now it was time to put these lessons into practice. The way you dig is you use one of these, a very small trowel, you're right, but you don't dig like that. We don't want to see holes dug. What we want you to do is to scrape with it. So you hold it like that and you scrape the soil towards you. So you scrape it up, making sure that you keep it level. You keep it flat because we go down in flat layers. We don't want to see any holes dug. When you've then got a little bit of soil, it goes onto your shovel, into the bucket with the same number on it. And then when your bucket's about half full, we take it over there and we sieve it. We put it through a sieve to make sure that you haven't missed anything. They learnt how to dig, the art of sieving, and how to recognise finds, artefacts. I do love working with school groups on excavations. I mean, it is absolutely exhausting, but it's so rewarding. And there's no reason why they can't work on a real excavation and do it properly, because everything's completely controlled. They're digging within individual metre squares. They're troweling very carefully. They're finding things that I basically can't see. And we're then sieving everything, 100% sieving, to make sure that we're not missing any artefacts. They're understanding about layers and stratigraphy. They're understanding about the local geology as well. There's so much learning that they're getting from doing this hands-on work. I just, I just love it. And what I hope as well is that this will sow seeds in them, that they will actually develop a love of history and archaeology that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. But soon it was the end of term and time for the grown-up volunteers to take over and carry on with the excavation. But while this trench was being excavated, a different part of the church was being explored the site of one of the four huge pillars that would have supported the central tower. To start with, it appeared to be little more than a heap of soil capped with stones, some bigger than others. So this is our next um, little <laughs> problem, is removing a probably half tonne block of stone. Okay, so should stay there. Yeah, then that's going to be that's going to be fine. Okay, okay. so you're ready? Ready to move it? Ooh, stop. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> you up? Okay, there we are. That'll do. That'll do. That's fine. That's great. When half the soil heap had been removed, something a bit more solid appeared. It was time to remove the other half and see if this really was the base of a huge pillar. Back at the main trench, there were answers to some of the original questions about the church. One of the problems that we had initially was that these stone blocks here mm. are mortared into the top of that sleeper wall. Mm -hmm. They are at a higher level than the floor mm. that we have in here. Mm. But then you just mentioned Salisbury. I was thinking, Salisbury, you've got those benches between some of the exactly Pier. a plinth yeah um running uh, as, a, as a footing for the entire arcade yeah. yeah all of the columns are set along a plinth yeah that that does seem to be what's happening they're very big stones and they're set at a cranky angle well, you'd expect it to be masonry facing but of course yeah um the masonry here is 
variable quality, isn't it? Yeah. In, in this area, you know, green sand is not necessarily the best. It could be that you have a rubble wall, which then you put a lime uh, mortar on. Some of the some of the stones are oddly squared, and that's what that's what gives me pause. Is that you've got a you've got a square at the back of that stone yeah. that's facing into the but, wall? But Why square we, it? But you see, reused. we've got squared blocks in there mm. and of course are they using stone from the earlier church from the anglo-saxon church that's exactly are they are they you know robbing out the old walls and using some of those faced stones just as the rubble core of the later that, building that that that's exactly the kind of thing that happened but there were now severe doubts about the cloister that was supposed to lie south of the church if those next two small trenches fail to reveal any wall at all, then mm. we really do have to question the whole idea of a southern cloister, don't we? Definitely. I mean, yeah. definitely. I mean, you, you'd absolutely expect to have seen something. You can't come down on natural one foot below the surface no. where there should be a cloister walk and explain that away. The cloister may well have been in that direction. On paper, you could pretty much fit a square cloister between here and the cliff edge. Yeah. I'm calling it a cliff edge. What do you call it? Yeah, the edge of Park Walk. Edge of Park Walk. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> much more modest, it a cliff, if you like. Dramatic yeah. Ruskinian yeah. cliff edge. No. So you can fit one in there, but the, but I've always thought that that's an illogical place to put it, because um, you'll. It's very tight anyway, isn't it's it? It's tight. You have to have a lot of um, functions like eating and sleeping and, and scribing, all that happens around a cloister. And you're right up against that cliff edge, but also it becomes the first thing you see, part of the mass of the building. To see the church itself with glittering windows and the spires and the sculptural details strikes me as a more logical first impression. And that view from the south, um, you see Lincoln Cathedral up on its hill, you see Durham impressively from its hit on, it, on its hilltop position. To see this with a, a nun's dining room, you know, in, in <laughs> yes. the foreground, strikes me as odd. And then the other question is, where's the kitchen? Where are the service um, rooms? Where's the, you know, the brewery, the buttery, the rest of it? Um, and to, that makes much more sense over that way. You know, hidden away, further inland, a bit more space, a, a, yeah. a crew yard for deliveries, yeah. that kind of and thing. And it's hidden from the sort of the town end as well, isn't it? From exactly. The... Yeah, first impressions really count. In a royal abbey, yeah. they really count. So, apparently, no cloister. But what about the mystery buttress? There are two competing uh, factors here. One is the supposed position of the piers that are marked out by those rockeries yeah. where the nave piers should be and of course piers is the thrust of those piers which is answered by buttresses on the outside they should be in alignment yeah. but the <laughs> 19... in the middle yeah, yeah the 1930s one put a buttress in the middle which is very odd and what you've what you've found is that this, that's obviously total tosh this is our main trench, the one that goes from outside to inside the church. And there were several things we wanted to try and find out from this. Firstly, did the cloister wall actually exist? And here in this first trench, I have to say, no sign of it whatsoever. Stones on the surface, but nothing underneath it. And then there was supposed to be a buttress here by the south wall, something helping to support that wall. But again, a heap of stones on the surface and nothing underneath it. So both those things were a bit of a puzzle. We have fortunately got both the south and north faces of the wall and the rubble core in the centre of it, so that's okay. And then we go inside the church. Now here, one of the big questions was whether these heaps of stones, these rockeries, actually do mark the position of the pillars that separated the main part of the nave from the aisle. Here, we've got the evidence that they do because there's a huge mortar foundation that would have supported a pillar and a very, very solid wall running between that one and what we assume is a real one here. So that's good, we've actually got some positive evidence. The other question in the interior was where the original floor was, the 14th century floor, and we have actually got some evidence for that. And here it is. These cracked and worn tiles are part of the 14th century floor of the abbey. Not a nice flat surface with shiny tiles but worn by the feet of thousands of people walking in this part of the church over centuries. And here, interestingly, sinking. We think there must be a grave underneath here. There's certainly a grave underneath there and this part of the church would have been where important people were buried. Eventually 
We'd dug four small trenches through the supposed cloister wall, with very few results. But this is supposed to be the corner of the cloisters, and this bit, the right angle, doesn't look very convincing at all. And I'm even less convinced because when I took off some of the stones here, underneath them I found a piece of plant pot. The cloister here on the south side of the church had always been a problem, and our excavations had failed to find any evidence of a wall where one was supposed to be. In contrast, the pillar in the central crossing had turned out to have very firm foundations and had sprung some surprises. Before we started digging here, this was a big, effectively a large rockery, heap of stones with plants growing on it, which supposedly marked the position of one of the four huge pillars that held up the central crossing tower. This is the place, this is the divide between the nuns part of the church and the nave, the public area of the church. Now, it's gone completely. We've taken it all away. But what we have come down to is a very, very solid mortar foundation. You can see the extent of it here. And where somebody's dug a hole through it, we can see that it's at least another metre deep. It obviously has to be to hold up a tower like this. So we're now fairly certain that this is the position of one of these major pillars. And it was here that we made our most remarkable discovery a beautifully carved stone head. Yeah. But it's a monarch. You think so? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's because you, when you showed me, you know, when I sent those photographs, you, you sent me someone that showed the, the hair on others. Oh, that, it's, it's totally 1320 to 1380 style of hair. Yeah. Mm. It's a lot like Edward II, although it could well be female, actually. Well, we, when we first saw it, we mm. thought female, mm. but I don't know. I mean, maybe it's sort of got quite a, I mean, a slightly squarer. Long hair was all the fashion, but the third had it down but to his shoulders. That, you, can, you can even see the eye defined on, on that side. Yes, you Look, can. Yes, you can. sort of eyelid and... No, that's wondrous, that is. Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, really nicely. Great quality of carving, too. The, the royal character with the crown and the care in sculpture, that's, that's for an important position, I'd say. Now, a couple of possibilities. One's inevitably a shrine I think it's too small for that it's not it's not life-size um, so what about interior interior the place um, where, at the crossing that dividing the, the public nave from well this is where we are that's exactly where we are yeah that's where pulpit and screens get put up yeah. and this is this is exactly the right kind of position and in a nunnery what's particularly interesting about that is that Canterbury and York well they're all males mm. in a nunnery would you have a screen of Queens Okay, I think that is as free as it's, it's just... Oh! Right, okay. <coughs> Into the hole. Right, okay. Look at that. Being dumped here, um, you presume that it wouldn't have fallen far no. from where it stood. No. And, well, this um, is what we're thinking, because you can't tell with all the surface stone where it's gone. It's all yeah. been moved around, but this has been dumped here, hasn't yeah. it? And if that were a queenly type that is emphasising the primacy of the East End, you know, the most yeah. important of the altars, the most glittering of the decoration of this church, um, the place where there is a royal shrine after all. Yeah absolutely appropriate for a house of sisters with a royal shrine in it to have a royal woman. The discovery of our royal woman was such an exciting moment. It was the find of the dig. But there's another smaller and much less spectacular find that in some ways has an even more remarkable story to tell. This is a bead, round, black and shiny. It's made of jet from Kimmeridge on the Dorset coast, and it's part of a rosary. The big Our Father bead, worn smooth by years of careful, prayerful handling. This was a precious object, part of one of a nun's few possessions. So how did it end up in the rubble of destruction? If objects could talk, 
Imagine what a human story this one would tell of a life of peace and prayer in a house of God, and then perhaps of a life disrupted, beads scattered on hard floors as all around was chaos and destruction. This is a story that we want to tell, not just of Shaftesbury's magnificent abbey, but of the people who lived and worked and prayed here. And this little bead will help us to tell that story.